Hello and welcome to What's With Healthcare podcast today. We are three nurses who have combined 90 year history of working and observing healthcare in action. We come together for every podcast and talk about a topic related to the healthcare system from our different perspectives we've had from working and experiencing it. We're here to share this knowledge and our perspectives, and we want to hear from everyone out there who's listening in, we, and we want you to help us to learn more and grow more and talk and share. That's why we're coming to you every week. We acknowledge and pay respects to the lands and the waterways of the traditional Aboriginal families from where we're podcasting from. So those lands are the Yugara, Turrbal and Durrambal peoples and always was and always will be Aboriginal lands. Hi everyone. On today's podcast, we are investigating and talking about sleep. So how can we make the most of our sleep? And uh, so it can help us to feel lighter and brighter. Continuing on our theme of nutrition to feel lighter and brighter last week. And then we'll be looking at movement next week. So it's pretty significant, the impact on us on ourselves when we don't get enough sleep. So surveys of the Australian population have shown that 13 to 33% of adults regularly don't get enough sleep. Well, Sleep Foundation research indicates that 33 to 45% of people, of Australian adults, are sleeping poorly or not long, not long enough on most nights of the week. So it seemed like it was a very relevant thing for us to look at. How can we sleep better? So Isabel is going to tell us, why do we sleep? Hi, everyone. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here talking about sleep. And that's a good question, Celeste, and very good introduction, because that highlights that this is a very significant problem. Uh, not only for you know people like us who have experience working in the healthcare and doing uh, shift work, but also in the general population. So why do we sleep? Uh, there are many biological processes that happen when we sleep. One of them is you know brain function. Within the brain, sleep enriches a diversity of functions, including our ability to learn, memorize, and make logic decisions and choices. Another area is our emotional well-being. Sleep calibrates our emotional circuits, our brain circuits, allowing us to navigate the next day social and psychological challenges with you know, a cool-headed uh, posture for the next day. Then another area is immunity, our immune system, preventing infection. Another function is proper insulin function because sleep uh, regulates the, uh, you know, the metabolism yeah? mm. and fine tune insulin and circulating glucose. Weight management, that's a good yes. one, that's a big one, right? Because sleep regulates appetite and help controls uh, body weight through healthy food selection, yeah? And also, you know, control impulsivity the next day. Mm. And also hormone regulation, like leptin, for example. And that's a really good point, Isabel. And I think just in some some of the people that we're coaching every day, um, you know, as we are getting a bit older, we do have a propensity to put on some kilos. Um, and then those kilos sometimes impact our sleep. And then if we're not sleeping well, then can you see how getting back control of our weight is really hard? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was going to add in there as well as when, uh, when you're on night shift and you're not getting enough sleep, but toast always tastes so good, you know. You can always, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sort of throws your appetite out a bit of whack too when you're not getting And sleep. also, sorry, that toast with a large amount of butter Absolutely. is even better. Just to point out, the more fat we add, it feels even better, doesn't it? Okay, Very so, yes. I agree, so, yes. I agree, Sue. I agree. <laughs> yeah, but so you can see how then we're adding more weight, which is increasing our sleep disorder, which is making us sleep poorly, which is we're in a bad cycle. Can you? So this is why it's really important to have this chat today to go, oh, my gosh, how can I sleep better? What can I control? What can I take control back of? Awesome. Yeah. 
So, and you know, just one more function, which is very important is our heart health. So when we have good quality sleep, so we are protecting the fitness of our cardiovascular system, lowering the blood pressure and keeping uh, our, our uh, hearts, you know, in fine condition. Mm. Because circadian rhythm patterns are in part of that too, aren't they, Isabel? Oh, Am yeah. I getting- yeah, so it could, because that's why we, we have sleep-wake cycles and we have, and that's why shift work sometimes in itself takes, it shortens your lifespan a little because you're going against your natural circadian rhythm patterns. And um, so that's why sleep is so important, isn't it? Because if we're interfering with it by working 24 hours a day, um, we, we increase our risks of heart disease and all of these things as well, don't we? Yes, that's yeah. correct. That's Thanks good. for the reminder. Sorry, I was just remembering something going, that's right, shift workers live a shorter life too because of that continual shift work. Sorry, good news in it, all of you shift workers listening, you're living a shorter life. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Sorry, I'll take that back. <laughs> yeah, no, and we're going to talk about ways to optimise the sleep, right? So, yeah, so as you can see, you know, um, sleep, uh, has you know so many functions in our uh, system that when we have lack of sleep, there are so many consequences because there are so many things that don't that do not don't work properly, and it affects you know our uh, mental health because we don't have the chance to repair you know uh, uh, overnight because you know dreaming for example is mm-hmm. a way for um, it's called like the um, emotional aid. When mm. you dream, uh, you know, it helps you to process those emotions and those memories and, you know, make them um, over time when you sleep and over time, it's not, well, they say that time, you know, cures, you know, every, every heartache, but it's not like that. It's not just time. It's, la- it's time when you sleep because yes. sleeping helps you to consolidate those emotional memories so they are not longer emotional. Mm. Then over the time, they're just memories. Yeah. The dream time is so important in so many Indigenous cultures across the world. Um, and so that's where, you know, yes, I know it's called REM sleep and all those fancy scientific terms, but in um, a lot of Indigenous cultures, the, the dream time, particularly our own Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, the dream time to be at rest, to let the stories of your ancestors speak to you to guide you are a really important time as well and as we lose connection with culture we lose some of this as well so it's really important from us you know if you have people from another diverse culture that that's where sleep is even more important to coach them through as well because they that's how they get connectivity back into some of their ancestors so yeah sorry I know that I keep interrupting as well, my apologies, but it's just, this is how important sleep is. Okay, so there are a few tips that, you know, most people out there are familiar with. And when we talk about sleep hygiene, and these are things that people can do to optimize sleep. And doesn't necessarily uh, is for people who have sleep disorders like insomnia, it's not to treat things like that. These are general tips for everyone, yeah, that wants to, you know, optimize sleep. Mm -hmm. One of the things that are important is regularity. It is recommended that we go to bed uh, at the same time and we wake up at the same time every day because we, um, our brains, that's how it works. And you were talking about the circadian rhythm as well before, uh, Sue. Yep. And this is one of the reasons why regularity is so important. So tip number one is to go to bed every day at the same time. It doesn't matter if it is a weekday or weekend. So if you wanna optimize your sleep, every day go to bed at the same time and then wake up the same time, right? A second uh, tip is temperature. And this is about keeping it cool, right? So our body needs to drop temperature uh, for about one Celsius degree to fall you know, into sleep. So it is recommended that our room temperature is below 18, it's around 18 uh, degrees Celsius. 
which is pretty hard in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so most houses we have aircon, which is good. <laughs> but yeah, so if you're having problems you, you with sleep, uh, then keep it cool. Yeah. Another thing is darkness. We are, you know, surrounded by lights, you know, artificial lights every day. And, you know, at home, we have screens everywhere. We have our phones, we have, you know, computers and everything. So, but one of the things that you can do is to just dim the lights at your house. And, you know, and that will help with releasing uh, melatonin, which is the uh, natural hormones that we release to get uh, sleepy. Another one would be uh, when you go to bed and you are, tr you are having difficulties falling asleep, then don't stay in bed. You can you know, think about um, going to, to a different room with dim light and do any other activity. It might be something like that relaxes you, like meditating, reading a book, or you know, doing anything that really works for you to um, uh, relax, uh, to relax you. Mm. But don't stay in bed because if you're in bed uh, and you know not falling asleep and just you know turning around and being awake and start thinking of things, so you your body you know get used to you know thinking that bed is a place for not sleeping. So you are training your your brain, you're training yourself yep. to not sleep. Uh, so yeah, so that's why it's recommended that if you can't fall asleep, don't stay in bed. After 25 minutes, go to a different room. Don't worry too much about it. Just think that, okay, this is not my night and mm. engage into, you know, a different activity and read a book and do something else until you get sleepy again. And once you're sleepy again, then go back to the room and then go back to bed. So it's sounding a bit like a mindful kind of awareness there, Isabel, um, that you don't we don't get into those ruminating thoughts and like, oh no, not again, I'm not going to sleep again. And then you get so focused on that that yeah, the brain can't sleep at all. Absolutely right. And that's something that happens, you know, when when you stay in bed, you start thinking about and getting anxious and getting worried. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, even getting anxious about going to sleep mm. you know, people who have you know sleep problems like insomnia that is what happens you know after because they are trying they're having this problem and they are staying in bed and you know starting thinking and ruminating as you said mm. and then you know going to bed and you know when the night comes so you are you know preparing to go to sleep then you are having this anxiety mm. around you know sleep exactly and perpetuate and yeah. I know some clients who with that ruminating pattern you know sometimes that ruminating pattern does happen a little bit to us if we're stressed we've got works really busy we've had a you know a disagreement with a loved one you know there's all those factors that can sometimes rip in there um, and I've had a few clients who sort of kept pen and paper next to their bed so that they can write down the thoughts that are they're thinking and then they just they they and then that's how they get them out and then they put them down and then that allows them to sort of get out of the ruminating pattern so that then they can get back to what you were talking there about Isabel is that mindfulness of I'm getting tired again now oh I can go to sleep yeah if you like the content of this video please give it a like you can also comment below if you have any more questions around you know sleep problems or if you want us to talk more about insomnia and what you can do uh, to improve your sleep please let us know and also you can subscribe to the channel if this is the kind of content that you like to listen to another thing that is also recommended is to uh, avoid alcohol and caffeine you know caffeine particularly afternoon um you know during the morning that's fine but just limit your caffeine intake after uh, you know midday so yeah. yeah to you know promote sleep and with alcohol um alcohol gives you like a, a like a sedative uh, sensation it sedates you but you may think that you're going to go to bed and have a good sleep, but that's not. You know, sedation is not the same as having natural sleep. 
And so avoid alcohol um, as much as you can. I mean, you know, if you're having sleep problems and you want to have a good night's sleep, then try to limit your alcohol intake. Well, right? you know, I mean, that makes logic, isn't it? Because alcohol is actually ethanol. Ethanol is quite toxic to our systems and our bodies and our cells. And so when we drink it, it, Yes, while you said, Isabel, it gives you that sedatory effect of, oh, now I'm tired. But unfortunately, our body has to metabolize it. So it actually makes our body work harder. So at two or three in the morning when we wake up, it's because our body has worked so hard and our liver and our kidneys have broken it all down that we've dehydrated ourselves from the ethanol. And then we wake up because we're dehydrated and our bodies are on hyper alert. And then we can't get back to sleep. Yeah. It's yeah. terrible what we do to ourselves. Why do we do that? What, what's going on? Let's analyze that another day. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a good topic for another conversation. <laughs> well, and you know, another, the last thing I want to mention, there are so many other, you know, things that you can do, but the five that I just mentioned are like, you know, common, you know, every, yes. most people know about these things. But another tip is to do nothing. So what I mean by that, if you had a bad night, then the next day, don't sleep in, don't nap, and don't go to bed earlier the next day. Because you, you want to wake up at the same time so you can build up enough sleep during the day. So when you go to bed, you're ready to have a good night's sleep. Yeah. So you, you want uh, the hours of, uh, to create sleepiness, basically. And and. This is really important because I guess some people listening into this podcast today are shift workers and they don't get good night's sleep every night because they might be on an early shift, they might be on a late shift, they might be on a night shift. They could be doing any combination of that and they're not, they don't have a proper pattern. So um, yeah, I guess how many nights can you go wrong with your sleeping before it's for it to sort of turn from being a sleep disorder into insomnia maybe that we have to do something a bit more or that's a really good question Sue yeah. if you sleep poorly three nights a week for three months then that's a criteria to you know start thinking about insomnia chronic insomnia uh, and then but as I said you know the diagnosis the medical diagnosis of insomnia is different to sleep disturbances because mm. everyone can have a bad night's sleep you know every now and then but then if it becomes regular three nights a week for more than three months then okay so that's uh, one of the diagnostic criteria for insomnia and then it it also you know insomnia needs to occur despite adequate opportunity for sleep so if you have enough time to sleep and then you can't sleep and you have problems with sleeping then that's another uh, criteria. Uh, another criteria is that uh, it's not better explained and that's not occur exclusively during uh, the course of another sleep-wake disorder. For example, narcolepsy, rhythm-related sleep disorders, uh, circad circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders, and parasomnia. So this is another uh, criteria. And then another one is coexisting mental disorders. That's the other one. Because uh, sometimes, you know, insomnia can be a um, standalone disorder or it can be secondary to something else. Let's say if you are struggling with anxiety, uh, so that's a mental health problem that's probably the primary cause and the insomnia is a symptom. Uh, same with depression right and things like that so if you have a mental health issue then it's probably very likely that the insomnia comes at secondary as a symptom and not the primary cause cause and i imagine some medications would interfere with that as well um isabel Absolutely. Is that all out of whack yeah yeah and that's another criteria like insomnia is not explained by medications that you are taking mm -hmm. uh -huh. let's see uh, also, you know, if you have a bad night's sleep, but the next day you can function and have no problem, then that's probably not insomnia. 
when you have insomnia, it, it affects the next day. It, it affects your social, occupational, you know, your academic uh, life uh, and behavior as well. So it affects the, ne the, the next day. It's not just because you had a, you know, bad night sleeping. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, I have insomnia. No, it, it affects what you do in your normal life. Mm, so your ability to function, your ability to cope, your emotions, sounds like it's across the board, Isabel. Yes, absolutely right. And there are, you know, um, you know, people have experienced insomnia in different ways because there are people who have difficulty initiating sleep. Other people have difficulty maintaining sleep. Uh, and they wake up, you know, frequently during the night and they don't feel, you know, the next the next day they feel dissatisfaction with their sleep. Mm -hmm. And another is when people wake up early in the morning with inability to go back to sleep. Right. So one person when it's with insomnia can have one of those problems or can have, you know, two or the three of them. So, Isabel, uh, insomnia certainly has far-reaching effects and implications for us and our ability to function. So um, what can we do about it? That's a great question, Celeste. Uh, and, you know, when you go online, you can find so many, huh. you know, tips and, you know, tricks and whatever to help with sleeping problems. Um, and, you know, you can even buy a lot of, uh, devices and things like that to help promoting sleep. However, um, I feel like we should go back to the basic and instead of, you know, going and buy and spend money on those sort of things, go back to your GP. I would go to the doctor and explain what's going on with me and try not to self-medicate or anything like that. Just go to your GP and start, you know, there. Mm. You know, the the, the the treatment for insomnia involves several things, but what is been um, the front, you know, the, the first line therapy at the moment is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And these, you know, have uh, a lot of components, but you know, five components, uh, the, the core components are five, and that is sleep hygiene, which is basically a few of the things that we just talked about. Mm. And then something called, um, they used to call it sleep restriction, but now they're changing the term to sleep uh, or bed schedule. That is the time that you go to, um, to bed. Yes. Then stimulus control. The next is relaxation strategies and also cognitive therapy. So the aim of this cognitive behavioral therapy is to modify um, cognition so our beliefs around sleep, you know, the beliefs that are not uh, true or mm -hmm. misbeliefs, basically, uh, and also modify behaviors around uh, what you do when you go to sleep. Yeah. So that's sort of the first line therapy at the moment. If that doesn't work, uh, then your, your doctor might recommend some medications, right? And then we have uh, a lot of... Uh, drugs that are used for that, uh, but also, you know, a combination of medications and CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, it's sort of uh, very effective as well. And then if that doesn't work, your GP would refer you to a sleep specialist and see mm. whether there's any other uh, problem there. Because it is in, it is a big area in medicine where there is people are sent to you know breathing specialists and you've got to have your sleep analysis and you can see why just general people out in the world get lost and feel that it gets so much bigger than them because they already feel a bit lost because they're tired their brain's tired and so their emotional parts of them can't think properly and then mm -hmm. they've got all of this you know information that's being forwarded to them about how they can do it differently they've probably tried just about everything it's you can see why people feel trapped can't you yeah and absolutely. your decision making becomes impaired as well with all that lack of sleep it's a bit overwhelming yes. exactly right so it's a really important topic to talk about um today but i think 
going back to Celeste, when Celeste talked last week about nutrition and how if we, it, it, we've really got to think about what we're putting in our bodies because our sleep reacts to what we've put in our body too. So, you know, if we've put good food and, you know, nutrition in there um, and we've really watched what we've eaten and we've avoided the caffeine and the alcohol and done those things, you can see how that is really good components to our sleep as well and you know next week I am going to talk about movement so movement we know um, got to move it to get actually tired enough to want to go to sleep um, so that's another factor as well so yeah the, those three foundational factors of nutrition sleep and movement are all very closely interrelated aren't they mm. absolutely and <sighs> another last thought that I wanted to add is that a lot of the issues that we have with sleep and also nutrition um, have anxiety as an underlying, you know, uh, issue. Uh, and sometimes it is good to stop and reflect to see whether, you know, that is something that is impacting my sleep, my nutrition, you know, my choices mm. uh, and impacting my health. Mm. 100% because sometimes we're eating not the best, you know, our mind knows what proper nutrition is, but then we're choosing food that's, you know, managing my boredom or managing my stress or managing my lack of confidence or managing my self-esteem. So I'm eating food for that purpose, not eating food for the right reasons as well. So so much, there's a lot, isn't there, to think about our motivation for everything we do thanks isabel so folks if you enjoyed this episode with with us uh today don't forget to like share and subscribe and uh put the word out we covered nutrition in our episode last week so and next week we'll be going into movement and these are the three pillars of our healthy lifestyle and they do all interrelate so We'll wrap it all up next week when we look at movement with Sue. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all for today.